Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome again to the CPV sem seminar. Um, so today uh, we are going to hear a, a talk by Emily Perry, who's a final year PhD student um, at UCL working um, in the uh, within the LZ experiment. Um, and uh, she's uh, specifically working on um, radon backgrounds for the for the LZ experiment. Uh, and today we're going to be hearing um, all about uh, radon. Uh, so thank you, uh, Emily, for uh, I guess waking up <laughs> to 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 be with us, um, and uh, I'll I'll leave it in your hands. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I apologize; I would normally have my camera on, but um, it's seven a.m. and I'm still in my flat, so the internet's not that great. Um, but yeah, just let me know if I cut out at any point. So yeah, um, I'm Emily, and um, today I'm going to be talking about ultra-low um, cold radon assays for rare event searches. Um, so like that was just mentioned, I spend 50% of my time working on um, the Lux Zeppelin dark matter detector. So just a pre-warning, a lot of this talk will be from the standpoint of Lux Zeppelin, but um, a lot of the points I'll make are valid to many rare event searches. Um, I spend the other 50% of my time working at the Cold Radon Emanation Facility, which is a radon um, assay facility, and that's going to be um, the focus of the second half of this talk. Okay, so this is just an outline of the talk. Um, it can kind of be split into two parts. So the first thing I'm going to try and cover is just give a bit of background to um, the radon challenge that a lot of rare event searchers are facing. Um, and then also talk about how we can attempt to mitigate this radon. So the main ways we can do this are through analysis of our data um, and also through mitigation through material screening. Um, the second part of the talk will then be on the requirements. So the radon um, activity requirements for next generation detectors. And then um, I'll move on to talk about the cold radon emanation facility. Okay, um, so just a bit of context um, for anyone that's not too familiar with LZ. Um, so yeah, I work um, as part of the Lux Zeppelin team um, and LZ is currently the world leading dark matter detector. Um, this talk is focused on radon. So the point I really wanna make here is just show the sheer scale of the LZ detector and kind of give you an idea of the amount of materials assays that were done for, the, for this experiment. So LZ has um, three detection systems. Um, the first you see on the far left. So this is the time projection chamber, um, which houses seven tons of liquid xenon. Um, and inside of this time projection chamber, um, book ending each side, we have a bottom and top PMT array. And so that's what you see in the center. Um, we then also have an additional skin detector. Um, so this adds um, two tons of liquid xenon to the already seven tons. Um, and this also acts as a scintillator as well. And then finally, we have more materials. So we have our outer detector, um, which you see on the far right. Um, and this is just a tank filled with gadolinium doped liquid scintillator. Um, and then this is surrounded by um, these larger PMTs um, that you see in the image. So the OD has uh, many benefits, but the main one is that it's able to efficiently capture neutrons. Um, okay, um, but shift into radon now. Um, so the radon challenge is pretty much the four um, LZ at least. Um, radon makes up around 76% of the total electron recall background. Um, so this is obviously dominant, um, and it's not actually the radon itself, which is our background, it's um, its granddaughter, um, LED-214. And this is basically, you can imagine that you have radon inside of your active volume of your detector, and then when you reach the granddaughter um, in the decay chain, this um, LED is going to decay via a beta decay. Um, and this is fine, but the problem is that sometimes this decay will happen naked, so what this means is that there's not a high energy gamma attached. Um, and the problem is that this beta decay on its own can mimic our WIMP signal. Um, and that's basically what the second bullet point says, but just in a slightly different way. So this lead decay is an electron recall background. Um, but the issue is that this electron recall band um, in our data can bleed into the nuclear recall band. Um, so this is where we expect the WIMPs to be. 
And then just as a bit of context, so the radon activity that was seen for LZ in the recent first science run was around two microbet per kilogram. Um, and if you want to read the LZ um, science run paper, that's linked there. So the, the plots I have here are actually from the LZ projected WIMP sensitivity paper. Um, and I think they kind of d demonstrate the point I'm trying to make quite well. So on the left, you see a plot of the total um, electron recall background spectra um, within the fiducial volume for LZ over the energy range of zero to 100 kilo electron volts. Um, and the point I'm trying to make is that the total ER background is given by the black line. And then we see the radon 222 um, as the most dominant background in the blue. The other plot from the same paper, so on the right, shows us our minimum detectable spin independent WIMP nucleon um, cross section for certain radon activities. Um, so, like I said just now, um, LZ sits at around two microbat per kilogram. But you can really see if we even just double or triple or quadruple this number in activity, we really start to impact our, our um, wind search negatively. Um, so it shows how important how important this radon challenge is. Okay, so just a little bit more on radon. Um, there's actually two radon decay chains that we care about. So the first is the one I'm really going to mention the most. Um, it's the radon 222 decay chain. But we do have this less dominant radon 220 decay chain as well. Um, and then just a bit more context on what each of the isotopes do. So when you have a material, say a detector <clears throat> material that's intrinsically contaminated with uranium and thorium, um, radon from that material is going to emanate out inside to your active um, detector volume. Um, it should also be noted, and it's a really important point, that any contamination in any spaces, um, say of the LZ system or xenon intern or anything like that, um, if any of those systems see the xenon and are contaminated, they will feed radon into the detector. Um, so a good example of this is, say, the circulation system for a detector. You need to make sure that that is also super clean, um, otherwise you will contaminate your active volume. Um, and then just a little bit more context. So when I refer to door to plate out, um, so this will be a bit later on um, from prior radon exposure, this really only refers to the lead 210 and after. Um, and basically what you can imagine is happening is if you have a detector material, um, so this is before construction, if you have the detector material sat in some radon air, um, the isotopes are gonna begin to stick to the surface of, the, of this material. Um, this becomes a problem because when you eventually construct your detector, you're going to have this lead 210 plated out on the surface um, of your material. And then at some later time, we can see this polonium 210 decay happening. Um, and this can be problematic because it can happen at different implantation depths um, within the material. Um, and also is the main reason that we really need um, a wall background model for many rare event searches. OK, and then I think this is my last slide on radon context, but I, I think I've said this in a slightly different way already. But um, this is just a slide on how exactly radon gets into the detector. So this is a screenshot from um, the Lux dark matter search paper and basically just shows the Z versus R squared and XY dependence of radon and each of its isotopes. Um, and basically the point is that the radon and its initial daughter, polonium-218, diffuse generally uniformly around the detector. Um, we will see in the next slide that this uniformity does depend on detector specifics, um, and we've seen the slight differences in LZ. Um, but yeah, I'll come on to that in the next slide. Um, I've already said that we do expect this polonium-210 around the wall from the lead um, play out on the on the detector material surface. And then we have these isotopes which kind of sit in the middle. So between the radon and the polonium 210 in the decay chain. So for example, polonium 214. And we actually expect these to be located closer to the bottom of our detector um, in terms of LZ. And this is basically because when your radon decays, um, each isotope is going to have some probability of being charged. 
Um, so in LZ and many other rare event searches, um, we use an electric field, so with some grids across our time projection chamber. And these um, isotopes, charged isotopes, are going to be attracted towards um, the negative grid at the bottom. OK, um, so shifting gears a bit, um, I talked about how there's mainly two ways that we can mitigate radon um, in rare event searches. So the first thing we can do is we can try and mitigate it through analysis. Um, so this slide shows um, the link is here as well. It's the recent LZ backgrounds paper for the first science run um, and shows the two ways that we, we can combat the radon issue. So you can imagine that we've we've created our detector. Um, it's all set up. We're kind of stuck with the radon activity we have at this point. Um, so it's really important that we understand exactly how much radon we have within our fiducial volume, um, with the fiducial volume being the active um, detector space where you're searching for WIMPs. So the first thing we can do, which is on the left, is something called alpha tagging. Um, this is relatively straightforward. Um, it basically is just searching for the high energy alpha decays within the fiducial volume and then plotting them as a function of energy. Um, this is quite easy because we can tag the alphas with quite high efficiencies. Um, and you can see radon 2 to 2 appearing and then the daughters appearing um, around this energy. And the idea is that you just want to fit these peaks um, as best as you can to extract rates within your fiducial volume. Um, so at least now you know the exact number that you're expecting there. Um, something quite nice we can do, which is what I work on, well, what I used to work on quite a lot um, for around a year and a half was the short time coincidences. So if I just go back a couple of slides, um, Within the radon decay chain, um, I've circled a couple of the isotopes um, in pink, and these basically correspond to these short time coincidences. And what I mean by this is that you'll have a second decay very quickly after the first decay. So in the case of radon polonium, you're going to see the polonium around three minutes after the radon. And then again, in terms of the BIPO that happens here, this polonium is going to decay around 160 microseconds after the bismuth. Um, so very close together. And basically what this allows us to do is individually tag um, radon polonium and bismuth polonium decays um, like atom by atom. Um, this is beneficial because it allows us to study ion mobilities, um, any flow studies within the detector, so how the xenon is moving, um, and also allows us to look at the distributions of each of the isotopes. So this is exactly what's shown on the top two panels. Um, we see the polonium-218 data. So um, like I alluded to earlier, for LZ, we do actually see this quiet region um, within the fiducial volume, which wasn't seen in LUX. Um, and then later on, we can also look at the distribution of the polonium-214. Um, and again, we see the majority of this um, at the lower part of our detector, so towards the cathode. So um, one really nice thing we can do, um, which is what I've worked on, is try and simulate where we expect our problematic lead 214 background to be. Um, so the way that I've done this is um, create a very basic toy model um, of the decay chain. Um, and I didn't want to go into too much detail about this here because it isn't, isn't really the, the focus of the talk. But you can create this toy model with information about the charge um, distributions um, and the mobilities, and then um, confirm the validity of your model by simulating the polonium-214 distribution and comparing to the data. Um, so this is what you see on the right panels. Um, and you can kind of see that we confirmed that our, our model was, it looked OK. Um, so then what we did is we moved back a few steps and then just simulated the lead 214 positions. Um, so that's what you see in the plot on the bottom left. And then this dotted line that sits um, within the plot is actually the um, LZ Science Run 1 fiducial volume. So where we're going to look for WIMPs. Um, and this plot is really valuable because it gives us an idea of how much of the lead 214 we do expect within this volume um, versus the rest of the detector. So again, we've been able to mitigate some of our activity um, um, through looking at these short time coincidences. 
Okay, and then moving on again. So the other option for radon mitigation, which is going to be um, the focus of the rest of this talk, is to inform our background models through material screening. Um, so this is something that LZ did, of course. Um, LZ took part in an extensive two-year material screening campaign. Um, and if you're interested in reading the paper, it's linked there. Um, but the screenshotted table here is the final backgrounds table from this paper. And I appreciate there's a lot of information here. I think the point that I want to make is that we can look at different backgrounds with different techniques. So if you follow the pink arrows, um, this these correspond to materials assay techniques, which can target the intrinsic initial activities of uranium and thorium. Um, we also have other techniques which can um, combat the radon emanation itself. So to look directly at the radon and the resulting alphas after this. And then finally, we have other um, assay techniques which can specifically look at surface contamination. So this is this um, plate out of lead 210 and the results in um, surface decay of polonium 210. Um, but I'll come on to each of these um, as I'm going through the slides. Okay, um, so as I said, I will be talking about CREF in the second half of this talk. Um, but before I do this, I really just wanted to give an overview of um, the UK's um, radon mitigation facilities, um, because there is quite a few. So if we go from left to right, um, we have alpha counters. Um, so these use um, pin diodes, and these are generally based at UCL and RAL. Um, so RAL is um, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, which sits just outside of Oxford, and this is where CREF, CREF is housed. Um, another type of assay we can do, which I think maybe people on this call have more experience than me in, is um, ICPMS. So this is inductively coupled mass spectrometry. And the capability within the UK originally sat at UCL. So um, there's a paper linked here from its time at UCL but it's since been moved to Bowlby Underground Laboratory. And then finally, of course, we have Bowlby, um, which sits um, in North Yorkshire, just at the top of the UK. And this um, facility has a dedicated um, um, screening, screening facility. Okay, um, but just to give a bit more context to each of these, um, I wanted to talk about the alpha counters because this is how CREF operates. Um, so alpha counters can be used um, and they really target these alpha decays that are happening post radon 222 emanation. So that's what I've tried to highlight here in the pink. And the idea is that you have some detector, um, which looks like this. Um, you have the stainless steel vessel. And the idea is that you have some material that's been emanating radon and then you pass this radon gas into the detector. Um, this detector is going to have a negative electric field applied over it. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, um, when radon inevitably decays, some of its daughters are going to be charged. So the charged daughters are going to drift upwards in this electric field towards this silicone pin diode um, where their alpha decays will, will be detected. So that's exactly what you see here. You see a calibration spectrum. Um, this is actually the previous UCL radon detector um, because I didn't want to give any, too many spoilers for CREF just yet. But yeah, we see um, the polonium-214, the 218, and then the surface contamination of polonium-210. So this system has lots of benefits. Um, I think the best one is that it's a direct measurement of alpha decaying daughters um, and also that it's non-destructive. Um, so if you want a mater material assay, you will get it back. Um, so just the main drawback is that this is a long measurement. So each measurement takes on average around six weeks. Um, and this is basically because um, when you allow material to emanate radon, you have to allow it to reach secular equilibrium, which takes on the order of a month. And then even after this, so after you introduce your sample to your detector, we're looking at say 10 to 20 counts per day. So this is a ultra low background um, technique. So you really need to build up your stats over the order of one to two weeks um, to get an accurate measurement. 
Um, so yeah, I've, I've mentioned already. So he originally had the UCL system, which has since been decommissioned. Um, CREF is up and running. So I'm going to be talking about this later. And then finally, there are alpha detectors, which are currently being commissioned at Bowlby. Um, and they are on track to have a similar sensitivity um, as the CREF detector. Okay, and then switching to the top of the decay chain. Um, so we have ICPMS, and um, like I just said, this um, technique directly targets the intrinsic uranium and thorium activities, um, and your activity is returned in parts per trillion concentrations. So this is a very brief measurement overview. Um, it's not my expertise, but um, it generally requires very small samples, um, which are digested and then introduced into a solution. Um, here we see some screenshots of the UCL lab or the old UCL lab. Um, and some there are huge benefits to ICPMS. So uh, a big one is that it's a rapid assay technique. So unlike alpha counters, which take on the order of six weeks, you're looking on, on the order of hours um, um, for this material assay. It's also really important that we have these rapid assays because it allows us to make these turnaround yes or no decisions for materials before we commit to these, these longer assay techniques. So like germanium detectors or like alpha counters. Um, another benefit is that it can inform um, the background model in the way that other assay measurements can't. Um, so other measurements can't actually um, explicitly find this um, intrinsic uranium and thorium activity. Um, there are some significant drawbacks to this type of assay, um, the main one being that it is destructive. So like I just said, you digest your sample in a solution, so you will not be getting it back. Um, and another important point is that the throughput of this assay technique is limited by sample preparation time. Um, it's quite a, a complicated um, technique and definitely requires expertise. So. Um, um, that's definitely something to keep in mind. And then in terms of the current UK facilities, so this ICPMS lab has since been moved to Bowlby, um, and we're looking at a less than 10 parts per trillion sensitivity to um, the uranium and thorium. And again, these assays can happen in less than a day for almost any material. Okay, and then finally, um, I just wanted to talk about Bowlby Underground Laboratory a bit. Um, so this is a lab up in North Yorkshire um, and is a 4,000 metre cube laboratory, which is fully commissioned. Um, so Bowlby is an ISO 6 or 7 clean room throughout. Um, and before I get onto the next slide, which talks about the assay techniques that they have, um, I just want to point out the amount of things that actually happen at Bowlby. Um, so I visited a fair amount of times and it's great every time you go. So. There's dark matter detectors there, neutrino physics, um, and a lot more, but not even that, not even just physics. There's lots of geology that happens there, carbon capture, um, planetary exploration technology studies. Um, yeah, it, it's a really great place. But okay, um, back onto the materials assay techniques that Bowlby has. Um, so it's really a unique facility in terms that of its design to become a center of excellence for material assay and cleanliness. And the thing that makes it stand out from other facilities is that it really aims to bring together all complementary assay techniques um, to enable the full exploration of these uranium and thorium decay chains. So um, these um, images here are actually screenshots of slides um, from Shinran Lu. Um, for, from um, the Low Radioactive Techniques Conference in 2022. And I think if you're interested in learning more about Bowlby, um, just follow that link. It's a great set of slides. But just very, very briefly to give an outline of what Bowlby can do. Um, so they can look at things like radon plate out. So this is targeting the lead 210 and the polonium um, 210 emission from surfaces. And they do this with a technique called XIA. Um, of course, like I just said, Bowlby is currently in its commissioning phases for some alpha counters um, as well, and these target the radon emanation. And then finally, they have a huge germanium detector setup. Um, so this targets um, the early chain isotopes. 
Okay, and then shifting gears again. Um, so here I just kind of wanted to outline the past, present, and future radon levels in some liquid xenon experiments. So we start in 2013 with Lux, and then I've gone all the way to 2028, which is the predicted start of the um, XLZD next generation um, rare event search detector. And I think really what I just want to point out here is if you look at the observed radon rate um, in time versus the sensitivity of each of these detectors, um, we can see how, how much an improvement has been made over the order of 10 years. So originally with Lux, there's the 70 microbat per kilogram activity. And now we're in the days of LZ and Xenon N-turn, which both see around two microbat per kilogram. And again, if you look at the sensitivity, we've managed to get an improvement of a factor of a factor of two. Um, here is a bit of a spoiler. So for the next generation dark matter detector, um, we need to improve, minimize this activity by a factor of 10 ish um, in order to achieve um, this 10 to the minus 49 WIMP cross section improvement. Okay, and then this is the same message, just in a slightly different way. Um, it's not really in the scope of my talk to be talking about this plot, um, but it's the WIMP nucleon scattering cross-section um, plot for different WIMP masses. And again, LZ is the current world lead in detector. We see the LZ exclusion here. Um, but again, the point that I was trying to make is that there's still this huge amount of space that's currently unexplored. So the need to mitigate radon further is, is really pre um, prevalent. Okay, and then um, finally, before I move on um, to talk about CREF, um, here are the radon requirements for the next generation um, dark matter detector. So a lot of these numbers have been taken from um, this paper here, which is a study by the Darwin collaboration for this next generation detector. And the things I really want to highlight are in pink. So again, I just mentioned that we need this factor of 10 minimization in the radon activity. Um, but the Darwin collaboration do go on to talk about other uh, radon mitigation options in this paper. So just skipping the pink one for now, they talk about things like radon barrier studies and also uh, more R&D into inline radon removal systems. But the thing that I'm going to be focusing on is the requirement for low temperature radon emanation and recall assays for material selection. OK, um, so finally, this is where CREF comes in. Um, so a bit of context on cold radon emanation. So we know that the total radon emanation from a material is given by its emanation due to recoil. Um, and this is when you simply have your radon decay and your alpha shoot in different ways. So that's recoil um, emanation. And then we also have emanation due to diffusion. Um, and this is simply just when the, the radon is moving through your material. So we know that radon diffusion is suppressed in some materials at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and this is extremely important because uh, all these experiments, so LZs, xenon n turn, et cetera, all operate at, at cold temperatures. They're, they're not at room temperature. So high sensitivity radon assay facilities do exist. Um, I've talked about a few of them. Um, of course, there's some that sit outside of the UK as well. Um, but the limitation of these is that they only operate at room temperature. So this can lead to uncertainties um, in the activity that we return. And again, this is basically just due to this cold suppression of radon diffusion. So there's actually um, just limited data available on the temperature dependence of radon emanation. Um, and it's something that really should be understood for these next generation detectors. Um, and this is because this knowledge would allow us to better understand our background model. So better understand what activity we do actually expect at operating conditions. Um, and of course, this would also reduce our uncertainties. So we don't have to try and take into account um, this radon diffusion in the uncertainty. Another point is that it would also allow us to relax our limits on the activity of individual components. Um, so what I mean by this is if you imagine you had some material you wanted to use to construct your detector and it emanated X amount of radon at room temperature, but we saw that this emanation was reduced by a factor of two at, um, say, liquid xenon operating temperatures, 
then this would allow us to relax our limits on this material because we know that its activity will be suppressed um, when we're operating. So yeah, this is where Kraft comes in um, and, and hopes to help answer some of these questions. Okay, so this is just a brief introduction to the Kraft facility. Um, this is where I spend 50% of my time. Um, it's housed at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. So this is a facility that sits just outside of Oxford. Um, and CREF is the world's first dedicated cryogenic radon emanation system. So there are two emanation chambers available for assays at CREF. Um, and an emanation chamber is where you place the material you want to look at um, before you transfer a radon sample to the detector. So we have a very standard 2.7 liter chamber, um, which is operational both at room temperature as well as several fixed colder temperatures. And then perhaps more impressively, we have this very large 200 liter emanation chamber, um, which can be cooled and stabilized down to temperatures of around 77 Kelvin. Um, so this is what you see in the images. Um, on the next slide, I'll go into a bit more detail about exactly, about exactly what you'll see in here. But the huge benefits of, these larger, of this larger chamber is that it allows measurements of whole detector components. Um, so whereas before you have these couple of liter chambers and you have to really just give, give a sample of the material you want to assay, with this large emanation chamber, you really can just stick parts of your detector wall in or PMTs if you, if you so choose to. Um, another benefit of this large chamber is that the um, cooling system is quite advanced. Um, so it's actually refurbished from a cold neutron experiment from the Institute de Longueuil in Grenoble in France. Um, it's perhaps more high tech than we need, um, but the benefit of this is that it enables studies of the radon emanation rate as a function of temperature as well. Okay, and then just a bit more on the Kraft cooling systems. Um, so again, we have these two chambers. Um, the small emanation chamber is what you see in the two images um, on the right hand side. So uh, this is the chamber just sat um, in the clean room. And then we cool this chamber in quite a simple way. Um, so we simply just submerge it in a bucket of ethanol. Um, and then this ethanol is cooled by an EK90. So this is like what you see um, wrapping around the emanation chamber here. Um, the, the temperature of the emanation chamber and the liquid is monitored through temperature probes. Um, and the minimum temperature we can reach here is limited by the EK90. So it's minus 90 degrees Celsius. Um, like I said, the large emanation chamber is a lot more complicated than this. Um, so we have our 200 liter emanation chamber. Um, and around this chamber sits a 500 liter cryogenic vessel which is cooled by flowing cold nitrogen gas and liquid um, through it from a cryostat tank. So just going through the images, um, we have the front face of the emanation chamber at the bottom here, and then the cryogenic vessel sitting around it. Um, and this is inside of the clean room. And then if you come outside the clean room, you can see the back of the um, cryogenic vessel. And then this part here is our cryostat tank. And then if you move back even further, so this is really a bird's eye view of the craft facility. Um, you can see the cryostat tank here, and then these are our liquid nitrogen dewers that we use to cool the system. Um, yeah, and the minimum temperature we can reach is 77 Kelvin, and up to this temperature, the, the temperature control is, is very stable. Okay, um, this slide is here more for completeness sake. Um, I appreciate there's a lot going on. Um, but I think the point I wanna make on this slide is just to demonstrate how robust the CREF facility is. So there's kind of four ways that we can operate. So um, I think the ones to pay attention to are the small and large um, sample assays. So if you follow the colored arrows in your own time, you could see how we would conduct these assays. Um, but the benefit is that these can happen simultaneously. So even though the measurements take six weeks, um, we can kind of do the measurements in parallel. Um, so this increases our, our assay throughput as well. Um, but yeah, I will leave the slide here. Um, if people have specific questions, we can come back to it, um, but I'll leave it alone for now. 
Okay, but one thing I do want to talk about in detail is our electrostatic detector. Um, so I've already talked about alpha counters quite a bit. So CREF works in exactly the same way. Um, we have this um, AC stainless steel detector, which has been manufactured by the University of Tokyo. And it's exactly the same concept. So you introduce some radon into your vessel, and then this um, detector has an electric field applied over it. And any charged radon daughters are going to be attracted towards this silicone pin diode, which sits at the top of the detector. Um, we see the energies of the ejected alpha particles from the decay, which is what um, this plot shows. So we just see energy and ADC value versus counts. Um, and we can see the polonium-214 peak and the polonium-218 peak um, appearing quite clearly. Okay, um, and then to understand our detector, we really want to know how well can it measure radon and also what is the um, radon background. So in order to study the detector efficiencies at CREF, we use this um, radium flow through source, which has an activity of 1.52 kilobeck. Um, and it's quite simple. You basically just will allow this um, source to build up an activity for some time. And once you've reached your chosen activity, you will transfer this radon gas um, into the electrostatic detector. So again, we see an alpha spectra here, which has resulted from this calibration. Um, and then quite a nice plot we can make is the one in the center. So this shows the rate of each of the isotopes as a function of time. And then we can see for the first 24 hours or so, um, we were just taking detector backgrounds, so we didn't introduce any source. And then at the teal line, um, we introduced our radon source to our detector. And you can see both the polonium-214 and the 218 isotope activities rising and then subsequently decaying. So each of these um, decays is fitted with Bateman equations, um, and then we can extract the activity that we saw um, from these fits. So I believe this calibration that I've shown here was done in March, so quite recently. Um, and for this calibration, we saw a detector efficiency of around 26% for 218 um, and 37% for 214. Um, these might look bad, um, but actually we can think of this detector as only being able to be roughly 50% efficient. Um, so this can simply be thought of as if you have, say, a polonium stuck to your diode and then it ejects an alpha particle, half the time the alpha is going to go up and half the time the alpha is going to go down, so you won't see it. Um, so these numbers are an improvement on the previous UCL detector, um, which is great to see. And then another thing we want to do, of course, is look at the background of our detector. So we want to confirm that its background is low enough to operate as a ultra low radon facility. Um, so this is quite a straightforward measurement. We just leave our detector untouched um, on the order of one to four weeks. Um, so we tend to do these background measurements quite regularly um, just because they're easy to do. And when we're waiting for, for samples to emanate, um, we have some time. So you can see from, I think this was maybe 10 days or so, um, from this background measurement, we saw a count of less than one per day um, for both isotopes. So um, again, extremely, extremely low counts, which is great to see. Okay, and then one useful thing um, we can extract from the detector efficiency and the detector background is something called the minimum detectable activity or MDA. Um, and this MDA is taken from the null definition. Um, and if you wanna read about this, um, just look at this reference here. Um, I don't think, it's it's necessarily useful to go through all the maths here. Um, I think the point I really want to make is if you look at this plot. So this is a plot of the minimum detectable activity in Millibeck versus the elapsed time in days um, of a detector measurement. And we see the craft detector with the green line and the previous UCL radon detector in the pink line. Um, and we can see we've gained maybe an order of magnitude in, in MDA, which is great to see. Um, we also set ourselves this milestone of 0.1 millibeck um, to achieve for this detector, and you can see that we've surpassed this. And it's also reassuring that we remain under this line um, on the order of 30 days or after. 
So this MDA basically puts us on track for our sensitivity goal at CREF, um, which is great. Okay, and then another thing we did at CREF was took part in a quite a long system background characterization campaign. Um, so again, CREF is an ultra low background facility. And this means that we need to understand the background of each subcomponent of the facility well um, before attempting to do any actual material assays. So the um, method for looking at the background of each of the subcomponents is, is pretty similar to how we actually calibrate. So you allow your subcomponent of choice to build up an activity for 30 days. And again, this is um, just because if you set an activity of a radon source to zero, um, it will take around 30 days to reach secular equilibrium. So that's why we wait th these 30 days. Um, and then after this, you simply just do a injection of radon gas into your detector and then monitor the polonium decays over the order of a couple of weeks. Um, so that's exactly what we see here for these two plots. So the one on the left is 218 and the one on the right is 214. Um, and I believe this, this was the small emanation chamber um, background measurement. But okay, this table just shows the results of our background characterization campaign. Um, there's a couple of gaps in here and a couple of stars, but um, generally things look um, quite promising. So if we look at the counts per day numbers for each of the subsystems, so like our detector or our radon concentration line, which is um, basically just our gas system um, and the small emanation chamber, the large emanation chamber and the radon trap, um, these, these numbers aren't, aren't looking too concerning. Okay, and then finally, um, just to finish off my talk, I wanted to show something quite exciting. Um, so we recently did our first material assay at the CREF facility. Um, so we've done these assays both at room temperature and at some colder temperature, which is in the next slide. Um, and we decided to assay some untreated and unclean titanium blocks that were, were at RAL. So you can see a picture of these here, um, and these were inside the small emanation chamber. Um, and you can see the dimensions and the weight of each, each block in brackets here. So this is, was our first assay. So the aim here really was to keep the sample as dirty as possible. Um, and this is basically just because we wanted to maximize the statistics for our first warm to cold comparisons. Um, so in the yellow plot here, we see the alpha spectra. Um, so within the red bands, we see the polonium 218 and within the green, we see the 214. Um, this huge peak here is actually our polonium 210 surface contamination that I was talking about earlier. Um, and it's it's a big background to, um, in our ultra low assays. But this this is actually isn't a bad thing because it's easily separable from this polonium 218 peak. So actually having this surface contamination um, allows us to monitor our detector health constantly. Um, so we tend to just have a plot going at the facility, which shows us our rate of polonium 210. Um, and we just make sure that that stays roughly stable at all times. Um, so, OK, on the bottom, we see the same type of plots um, for 218 and 214. Um, and then the extracted activities of our samples from these are around six counts per day for 218 and 17 counts per day for 214. So an obvious comment to make, um, which is the same comment we made a few weeks ago, is why does the 214 appear a lot higher than the 218? Um, and we're still discussing this, but I think the favorite theory at the moment is that actually we're seeing leakage from the radon 220 decay chain. So you can actually see that there's this third peak here, which we haven't really seen before. Um, and the position of this actually corresponds to the polonium-212 isotope, which is from the radon-220 decay chain. So we think that maybe um, within the green bands, we have some kind of um, additional alpha decay contamination, which is increasing this activity number. Um, but this actually isn't bad news, it's good news. It's quite exciting because it shows us that CREF is sensitive enough um, that it can actually see this subdominant radon decay chain, um, which hasn't necessarily been true for um, these alpha counters until now. 
Okay, and then we see the same type of pots, but this is just the cold measurement. Um, you can see the small emanation chamber submerged in the ethanol, um, and the sample and the chamber were maintained at 50, minus 50 degrees Celsius for the entirety of the measurement. Um, we see the same alpha spectra again um, with a slightly reduced rate. And if we actually look at the um, activity plots, we can extract around 5.5 counts per day for 218 and 8 counts per day for 214. Um, so the 214 has definitely gone down. Um, it's hard to say just yet whether this is in fact cold suppression of radon diffusion, um, because again, this is our first assay. Um, but the point in showing these two slides, even though it's very recent work, is just to kind of demonstrate that CREF is a fully operational facility and that we're in the position where we're able to conduct these assays. Okay, and then um, my last slide is just a summary of CREF. Um, so just to backtrack a bit, um, we've seen that for the next generation rare event det detectors, we're going to require both an improved level of sensitivity to radon emanation at room temperature, as well as this knowledge of the temperature dependence of the emanation and construction materials. So CREF aims to provide both of these. So we've already seen that we see an improved sensitivity. Um, and then I've just shown that we, we are able to do assays at colder temperatures. Um, just a bullet point is that the facility is fully constructed. Um, we're pretty much ready to go. Um, and the, the results from the detector characterization do look promising. So we see a good efficiency, a very low background, um, and the MDA looks great. Um, one thing I actually didn't mention was the large emanation chamber, um, and this is because we're just in the last stages of preparing this chamber for assays. Um, so I'd expect to see something from this chamber soon, um, but I decided to, to leave it out of this talk. And yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there. If people want to reach out to me, um, feel free to email me about CREF or just Rodon in general. Um, and there's also these two nice videos um, that have been part of the outreach that we've done at CREF. So we have a video from Dark Matter Day a few years ago where you, you can actually see the facility and see the chamber being opened. And then we have this um, video from last year, and that's me there. Um, and yeah, if, if you're interested, I, I highly recommend checking them out. But yeah, that is the end of my talk. And thank you so much. I, I hope I didn't go over time. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Emily. Um... Yeah, um, uh, definitely didn't go over time. That was perfectly under time. Um, do you have any uh, <laughs> questions from the audience? Please just uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Bruce. Really, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I, purely by chance, I have quite recently got around to reading the um, Borexino paper on their uh, CNO neutrino measurement, which discusses some of these same background mitigation issues and migration of radioactive species around their volume and so on. Um, one of the issues there is how the material flows inside the detector volume in response to temperature gradients and convection and other migration and so on. And they went to this very significant effort to stabilize the temperature and the temperature gradient to stop species moving around. Can, can you comment on what that looks like in LZ? Does stuff sit there? Does it diffuse? Does it, does it circulate? What, how does it work? Yeah, so I'm not actually sure how much I'm allowed to say about it. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> um, we definitely, I mean, this is something that I've been heavily involved in. Um, and like you say, the again, I can't say too much, but we know that the stability of the temperature conditions does seriously impact this, this distribution you see. Um, so I think with LZ for the first science run, we almost got quite lucky in a way, um, because when we first saw these plots of the polonium-218 distributions, et cetera, having this blank space within the fiducial volume was was a big bonus on our part. Um, but you, it will change exactly depending on these conditions. Um, 
I'm not sure I can say too much more, but um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. But um, no, no, I mean you. you I'm curious about the the state of your inquiries and the and the state of knowledge, and you you've answered that question. Can you can you just run back to where you show the the decay chain with the alphas and betas? Yep. Yeah. So. So again, if we go with the left hand chain, which is the dominant one, um, am I am I right in understanding that the it was certainly the case with Borexino that some of the subsequent decays are important for gaining, particularly the alpha decays, which is sort of a bit spectacular. Uh, are important for gaining understanding about the the rate and the presence of the decay chain and so on. But you've also got this problem. Well, what if the two polonium two ten, for example, is being introduced independently mm -hmm. from the material rather than from the chain? Is that the same situation with LZ or? Yeah, definitely. So um, the when we. I haven't got a polonium 210 plot for LZ, but we can see it for Lux here, right? So Fine. it's the same type of situation. So we see the polonium 210 build up on the wall. And this is both because of the surface contamination prior to construction. Yep. Uh, but you also, of course, have, have the point where you do have these this radon constantly decaying within your detector. Um, and the half-life of lead to 10 which causes the play out on the surface is huge yeah but there is some small probability that the polonium 210 appearing on the wall is in fact from radon which existed in the detector at one point yeah. um but it's it's more likely going to be um surface contamination for the lead to for the polonium yeah. 210 yeah so i mean if you but if you see a two polonium 210 decay in the volume then it comes mm -hmm. from one or two sources it comes from decays running down the chain within the volume or it comes from a 210 that's sitting on the surface and has popped off the surface and migrated into the material and exactly and yeah. you need to make assumptions about or estimate or constrain the rate of the latter in order to to use the former yeah so the way we do it in lz is we simply just fit this polonium 210 peak so mm -hmm. take the worst case scenario so we just take into account both of these effects yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. No worries. Uh, anyone else? So I don't see people unmuting. So maybe I'll get my questions. Um, maybe more of a specific question. When you were discussing your um electrostatic detector, you quoted these two efficiencies um for the, the two isotopes of, of polonium, and I think you made the point that you expected a 50% efficiency because of the directions of the, the alphas or something uh, what what's the um what why why do you why do you observe kind of uh, fairly fairly significantly less than than 50% what what what's the the reason behind that um there's a couple actually so i always kind of kind of say the tagline that is 50% um because it's it's a little bit easier to say in a presentation but there's there's lots of things that are happening at the same time um so one thing that does make an impact is the carrier gas that we use so you can imagine if you have if you want to transport a radon sample into your electrostatic detector you have to use a gas to get it in there a carrier gas to push this radon through um and at cref we use nitrogen gas um, but we know that this nitrogen has some impurities. Um, so basically what's happening is if we have created charged daughters, so charged polonium-218 and charged polonium-214, some of these will be neutralized by these contaminations. Um, so we see less than we expect. Um, and then another point on that is that polonium-218 um, is more susceptible to impurities. Um, so that's why we see a slightly higher efficiency for the 214 as well. Um, so it's really a mixture. And then you also have the point where um, 
Some of the daughters you create are going to be neutral as well. So you never actually see those either. Um, so there's kind of these big three factors playing in. So the neutralization of ions, the actual neutral production of decay daughters. Um, and then this fact that if even if you do have a, an isotope stuck to the diode, sometimes the alpha is going to go down. So, so you're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that yeah, that that was my my other question then. Um, so, um, yeah, the other thing I, I was wondering if um, maybe you could elaborate a bit more about this um, thing you mentioned right at the end of the large emanation chamber. What mm -hmm. specifically are you trying to do with the well? What does large mean for, first of all, and what what specifically do you are you trying to do with with the uh, with this? Um, so the large emanation chamber. Um, basically, the complication is that. When this is kind of what this slide shows, which is a bit chaotic. So if you follow the orange lines, when you do an assay with the small emanation chamber, it's quite simple because the chamber is only two liters big and our detector is 80 liters big. So we don't need to concentrate our radon sample beforehand. We can just kind of throw it in and be happy. Um, whereas with the large chamber, it's 200 liters and our detector is 80 liters. Um, and we need to do around 10 volume replacements of the chamber to get um, most of the radon out of it. So this is just like the volume replacement law. Um, and so what we need to do is somehow concentrate our radon emanation sample from the large chamber before it's introduced into the detector. So we basically do this with a charcoal trap. Um, so this trap is held cold and then we pass our radon sample through it for on the order of say um, half hour or an hour, and then it's passed um, into the detector. Um, so we have done this, um, but the trap currently isn't as stable as we'd like it to be. So um, I refrain from putting it in this presentation, but yeah, the, the large emanation chamber just has an added layer of complication that you need to include this trap. Um, just a, a, very, a very basic question. What What, what is the, the goal of, the large, I mean, like what can you do in the large emanation chamber that you can't do in the, the small one? Um, it really is that we can assay really large components. So, right. um, and we have this temperature control that isn't possible with the small system. So it's beneficial as in like, if you wanted to assay a whole part of your wall before yeah, okay. it went into the construction, you can do that. Um, and that, yeah, it, it goes down to 77 Kelvin as well, which is significantly lower than we can get this small emanation chamber. So mm. um, yeah, the cold part is is really the driving factor yeah. as well. Um, yeah, I did also have a couple of questions more, I guess, sort of uh, looking kind of further to the future to like, the, so you, you quoted this sort of goal for, for XLCD of, of 0.1 microbecquels per, per kilogram. Um, is that number, I, I guess these are all sort of estimates at, at this stage, but like, is that number based on the kind of current electron nuclear recoil discrimination for like LZ and Xenon? Um, yeah. Presumably if you have like, you know, better separation between your electron and nuclear recoil bands, you, you could maybe tolerate a higher radon background. Is that correct? Or I, I guess yeah. you, still, you still want this low background as possible, but but is it possible that even if you don't reach that sort of level you could maybe tolerate it if you made it you know sort of improvements elsewhere yeah definitely you're completely right so here i have the sentence that you assume kind of the same mm. uh, scattering and nr acceptance as um lz has but yeah this this number will change a fair amount depending on what kind of discrimination you have definitely um yeah i think within like in this paper they talk about if you had different um discriminations between the bands how this number would be affected um but for this presentation i just chose to put it like within the context of lz um and i know kind of recently there's been a lot of discussion about the site like where xlcd would actually be Do, could you comment a, a bit about the 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 the, the questions that are that are you know limiting the radon background would would have on on kind of governing the the, the best site for XLCD is this a an issue are there different sites which are sort of better for for limiting radon background compared to others? Yeah, I think that's true. Some are better than others. Um, 
I'm definitely biased coming from a radon background. I automatically want to go with the low radon facilities. Mm. Um, but yeah, I I definitely I don't think I'm not really in touch with the decisions. It's it's above okay. my pay grade. But <laughs> what what, what um, sites would be considered the the sort of the best in that in that context then? I I'm very aware this might be incorrect, but I think Bowlby has an extremely low ambient radon activity compared to a lot of other sites. Mm. Um, so I think it's lower than Surf um, and perhaps Grand Sasso as well. So yeah, um, Bowlby is definitely in consideration because it does have that benefit, mm. um, which is also why the the bug, so the dedicated screen facility is, is at Bowlby because yeah. it, it automatically has this low ambient background, but... I think all meet the requirement. I, th I don't think there's like a, yeah. there's a prominent issue with any site necessarily. Yeah, sure. Um, all right. Well, we've uh, gone past 5 p.m. If anyone has any final questions, please go ahead. Um, but I didn't see any people. So yeah, well, let's uh, all thank um, Emily again for a very uh, fascinating talk. And uh, 